Good afternoon. I'll just give everyone a minute to get seated. We can get going. All right, welcome. Thank you very much for coming today to the Carnegie Endowment. I'm Kareem Sajidpour, a senior fellow here. Our discussion today is about the state of US-Iran relations. This month marks the 40th anniversary of the advent of the Islamic Republic in Iran, so we'll talk a little bit about the past, present, and future of US-Iran relations. I wanted to also welcome our audiences who are watching, um, watching on television, both a C-SPAN audience and for the first time, we're broadcasting this simultaneously in Iran, Persian translation with Iran International. So welcome to audiences in Iran and throughout the US. Uh, our panel is well known to most of you here, so I'll just introduce them very briefly. Let me start off to, my, to the far right, General David Petraeus, who was formerly the commander of US forces in the Middle East, the former director of the CIA, is now in the private sector in New York with KKR. Uh, to General Petraeus' left is Suzanne Maloney at the Brookings Institute, one of the most thoughtful scholars of Iran over the years, who was previously also at the State Department. And to my right is Ambassador Bill Burns, who was formerly Deputy Secretary of State. He's the president of the Carnegie Endowment, and he's the author of a terrific new book called The Back Channel. And I'd like to start with a two-part question for all of you. I'll start with you, um, with you Bill. And you had several decades working on the Middle East at the State Department. You were never obviously based in Tehran, but in your book you recount two interesting memos that you wrote to both Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, advocating for a different approach to Iran. So I'm curious, when you look back over the last four decades, do you think that there were examples, there were opportunities whereby we could have the United States could have engaged Iran, taken a different approach ir towards Iran that may have changed the adversarial nature of U.S.-Iran relations as they are now. Well, thanks. First, let me say it's great to be here at Carnegie. I guess I'm supposed to say that as the president of Carnegie, but it's, esp it's especially nice to share a stage with Dave Petraeus and Suzanne and Kareem, three people for whom I have enormous respect. Um, you mentioned the two memos that I had done when I was the number three in the State Department at the end of the George W. Bush administration, the beginning of the Obama administration, in which I made you know, a quite consistent argument, I guess demonstrating that the deep state is capable of making the same arguments to both Republican and Democratic administrations. But you know, essentially the argument was, even though the situations are not at all analogous of containment as it was applied in the Cold War, uh, toward the Soviet Union in American strategy and dealing with Iran since the Iranian Revolution 40 years ago, that I think in, in many ways you can borrow from that original concept. And by that I mean both in terms of diagnosis. In other words, we're dealing with you know, a leadership and a country with whom we have profound differences that's capable, in the case of Iran in a regional, not a global context, um, inflicting a fair amount of damage on us and our interests but also a regime that has its own internal contradictions, its own historical insecurities, a huge amount of baggage and mistrust and grievance on both sides. So that's the diagnosis. The prescription, I think, is similar in the following respects, that what I thought then and continue to think today is that what you need to do in terms of American strategy is push back against external overreach by that leadership, in this case, Iran and the Middle East. You need not to be shy about your concerns about human rights, but it also makes sense to selectively engage on areas where you can help manage a largely adversarial relationship. In the case of Iran, it had to do you know, in the Obama administration, especially with the most imminent threat, which was an unconstrained nuclear program. So the short answer to your question, in my view, is that I was always skeptical that there was some grand bargain out there, some overnight transformation in the U.S.-Iranian relationship that was possible. I do think we missed some tactical opportunities to better manage the relationship. One example is right after 9-11, when we dealt pretty seriously and extensively Ryan Crocker was the first of the American diplomats, whom Dave and I both know well, um, working with the Iranians who had both a stake in what came after the Taliban in Afghanistan and a fair amount of leverage as well. And that was a useful, cold-blooded, 
partnership um, in that era. We might have used that as the basis to begin engaging on the nuclear issue, remembering that at that point, you know, Iran was spinning dozens of centrifuges, not the thousands that they were spinning when we later engaged. So um, I do think we missed a moment then because after the axis of evil speech in early 2002, that effectively cut off that channel. So that's one example of a place where we weren't in a position, I think, to transform the relationship. It was going to be largely adversarial, but I think we could have managed it in a more effective way um, in the cold-blooded interests of both sides. So you played a, a critical role in the back-channel negotiations with Iran and Oman, which then led to the JCPOA, which you negotiated the first part of that. And I'm curious, what was your biggest one or two takeaways from your dealings with Iran that perhaps you would share with the current Trump administration? Sure. Well, I'm not sure anybody's looking for my free advice these days as a recovering diplomat. Um, you know, I, I think the lesson for me anyways, that notwithstanding the largely adversarial relationship, nature of the relationship, it was possible through selective, hard-nosed engagement to produce tangible results. And I think what I took away from, you know, long experience in dealing with senior Iranian officials was several things. First, that you had to deal with the Iranian leadership as a unitary actor. We always got ourselves in trouble in previous administrations when we tried to game the Iranian political system, searching for moderates and hardliners and others. We're not very good at that. And I think it's important to deal with the leadership as a, as a unitary actor, recognizing that there are all sorts of factions and differences, but it doesn't make sense, I think, to try to game it. Second, leverage matters. I mean, it wasn't a coincidence that when we began the secret talks, direct bilateral talks with the Iranians in early 2013, their oil exports had dropped by 50%. The value of the Iranian currency had dropped by 50%. So you would set the stage, I think, for a more serious negotiation. But then third and not least, you had to connect that leverage to realistic aims. Um, and that's where I get concerned about the current approach, which at least on the face of it, seems to suggest that the aims are either capitulation or implosion. And, and I think those are aims that are not tethered to history, at least as I've understood it. Thank you. General Patrice, I want to ask you the opposite question I asked Ambassador Burns, which is, were there opportunities, in your opinion, that we missed perhaps to either counter Iran to, to, to check the regional ambitions? In particular, one of the questions which comes up was perhaps an opportunity for the United States or Israel to assassinate the Iranian Revolutionary Guard commander Qasem Soleimani. So I'm curious how you would respond to that. Well, first of all, let me also say that I feel privileged to be on stage with uh, three individuals for whom I also have great respect. Um, second, I want to add a tiny bit to what Bill said, because as he will recall, we actually did reach out and conduct negotiations with the Iranians in Baghdad during the course of the surge. Uh, Ambassador Crocker was the negotiator. The challenge was so we had three rounds of this, and we thought there might be some opportunity to make some headway with them. Uh, but the fact was that it was very clear that there was no room at all for the negotiators. They literally would have to leave the room and make phone calls back to Tehran, literally to ask how do we respond to this particular uh, point or question from Ambassador Crocker. So they had no latitude. They weren't true negotiators. They were just a, a mouthpiece. Uh, and that was disappointing. We thought there was some opportunity. Um, beyond that, um, you know, look, I could neither confirm nor deny that we ever contemplated uh, doing something to Qasem Soleimani. I can tell you that Qasem Soleimani never set foot in Iraq during the time that I commanded the surge, nor the time that I was at CENTCOM. Uh, I forget where he was during Afghanistan, uh, and he was very careful when I ha just happened to be the director of the CIA. Um, he really traveled only in two countries that I recall, and those were obviously Iran and then in Syria. Um, there were some other opportunities. You know, if you, you always got to get the big ideas right, and I think the biggest of the big ideas with Iran was that you have to be firm. They will probe you. They will test you. If you don't respond, they'll push a little bit further. Um, and there may have been some opportunities. Um, the challenge was always the politics within Iraq. So, for example, when the Erbil Five were detained by our Special Operations Forces in January of 2007, these were five Quds Force operatives who were up to no good. 
uh, in a very significant way. Um, and I was not yet the commander. Uh, I was still going through the confirmation process at that time. I remember it though, and I remember the pressure was enormous uh, from, I believe, from both the president and the prime minister of Iraq at that time that we had to release them. And I talked to General Casey and my predecessor about that later on. And it seemed as if we just had no real choice. Again, it was a moment of real inflection. Here we are, we need the prime minister's support for the surge, the, the biggest of the big ideas of which were all contrary to what he had just agreed to accelerate with pri President Bush uh, in a meeting in Amman, Jordan in late November uh, of 2006. So again, I think the politics were just very, very difficult. The same is true uh, when it came to releasing Ali Musa Dakduk. Remember, he was a very high-ranking Lebanese Hezbollah uh, official who was detained together with uh, Kais Kazali and Laith Kazali, who were uh, part of the Asaba al-Haq later on. They were militia leaders who had carried cold-blooded murder uh, of five of our soldiers. Uh, we found the very detailed evidence, not just intelligence on that. That's what prevented, frankly, the prime minister from demanding that we release them after they were detained. I was very disappointed to see some five years after they were detained, that they were tried by an Iraqi court and basically found not guilty of anything, despite the extraordinary evidence that we had uh, connecting them with those murders. Um, frankly, the same with Kais Ghazali, uh, who is now a militia leader, and despite a constitution that prevents uh, militia leaders from being in the, or the law that prevents them from being in the Council of Representatives is a member of the, the COR. Uh, so, you know, welcome back to the land of the two rivers. Uh, it's an interesting place, as always. So I think, you know, there were some of those. Those are still pretty tactical opportunities. Uh, in the same way Bill, I think, talks about the others. Uh, there was the outreach from, of course, Qasem Soleimani to me through President Talibani in uh, March of 2008 uh, when we were fighting against the Shia militia, a very significant battle in Basra. Uh, and he wanted to be sure that I knew that he, Haji Qasem uh, Soleimani, and also Haji Qasem, uh, controlled the policy for Iran when it came to Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Gaza, and Afghanistan, and now presumably probably put Yemen in there as well. Let's never forget that it is the Quds Force that controls the policy, uh, not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or some other state organization. Uh, again, there was no real opportunity for constructive dialogue at that point in time, though. You know, there's, uh, as I said, audiences watching in Iran, and as the former director of the CIA, I think they'd be very curious to know, I'm curious, frankly, to know how you would rate uh, American intelligence on Iran, both in terms of our assessment, our understanding of Iranian societal political trends, and our, you know, technical uh, capacities. First, let me actually say hello to the Iranian people. Um, believe it or not, we used to have a lot of interaction with them because I would go to the border crossings uh, between Iraq and Iran. Uh, there were a lot of reasons to inspect those, frankly, and we had quite careful procedures uh, for that, and I wanted to make sure that they were being followed. Uh, but inevitably, we would encounter a flood of Iranian religious uh, tourists who were going to Najaf, Karbala, the other holy sites of Shia Islam. Of course, Najaf is the holiest. And coincidentally, it was the division I was privileged to command, the 101st Airborne Division, that liberated those sites during the fight to Baghdad when I was a two-star general. So I felt a certain continuing connection to Najaf and to Karbala. And it's pretty well known that we worked very hard to make sure that there wasn't even a nick in the famous Gold Dome Mosque uh, in Najaf, even though we were being shot at uh, quite significantly from areas near that. So we used to engage with them, and it was fascinating. Um, they actually were very positive. Uh, in fact, uh, Iranian, old Iranian women, women would come up, and they would always want to grab you by the cheek, and, you know, ah, General Petraeus, uh, you know, so good to see you. And my security, needless to say, thought they were going for the jugular on most occasions. Uh, it was not the case. Um, when it came to our, our intelligence, I have always felt that it was really quite solid. Uh, there are some very specific examples of this, that the so-called uh, secret site, say at Fordow, near Golm, I mean, we knew about that for, I think it was years, and it was, they 
declared it when they discovered somehow that we were about to out them on this. We were going to announce it to the world that there was this secret site that they had not declared. Uh, and generally, again, it, it comes and goes as methods and sources and all the rest of that uh, are good or you know not turn out to be not so good over time, inevitably. Uh, but together with other countries who also have really quite good intelligence uh, inside Iran, I felt uh, that we had quite a solid understanding. Um, there's a tiny degree of sense of black box about the supreme leader and the inner circle, needless to say. Um, but I think that's not unlike other countries where, again, trying to truly read the mind of a leader uh, has always been more than an imperfect science. Suzanne, I want to ask you to bring us to the present state of play. Obviously, you can feel free to re reflect on some of General Petraeus and Ambassador Burns' comments about the context. But in particular, I'm, I'm curious for your assessment of the Trump administration's current approach towards Iran. Um, I wrote a piece this morning in which I argue I think there's perhaps never been a greater disc discrepancy between a president and his national security advisor, and that President Trump has made it pretty clear that he uh, has no interest in conflict in the middle, middle East. He's not a democracy guy. He has an affinity for autocrats, whereas John Bolton has, has a long history of advocating for conflict, uh, regime change with Iran. So your assessment of the Trump administration's approach, and then how you think Iran is most likely to, to respond in the coming weeks and months. Great. Well, thank you so much, and I'm really honored to be part of this discussion with such a distinguished group of uh, speakers. I think it's important to, to, to talk about the Trump administration's policy with this backdrop of the history of U.S.-Iran relations and with the awareness that while there have been moments in time in almost every administration since 1979 that the U.S. and Iran might have come to a different opportunity for some kind of more productive dialogue. I think it's overly romanticized often that if only we had accepted or permitted the, the oil deal that was offered to Conoco, the first upstream deal in Iran since the revolution in 1995, or if only we had made good on uh, talks that began or avoided language like, uh, like axis of evil, somehow things would have been different. Um, we have been confronting with Iran um, a, a regime which is um, very much formulated around a presumption of anti-Americanism, a regime that for most of its post-revolutionary history has been unwilling to engage directly in public authoritative fashion with the United States, with only a couple of exceptions, which of course have already been referenced here in the post-9-11 opportunities, some of the dialogues that took place um, when General Petraeus was in Baghdad, and uh, most recently, of course, the negotiations that led up to the JCPOA. We have become accustomed, I think, to seeing Javad Zarif on our television screens, the Iranian foreign minister speaking directly to the American people and to the American president. But of course, that is a relatively new feature of the bilateral dynamic. And, and it's important to remember that for most of the past 40 years, we've been laboring with the difficulty of, of an adversary that uh, has often uh, sought to avoid any direct dialogue with us. I think that's no longer the case today, and that is one of the few advantages to the situation that we find ourselves in in the aftermath of the Trump administration's decision to walk away from the Iran nuclear deal. Um, as Kareem points out uh, very eloquently in the piece that he's published today in The Atlantic, there is this divergence that's um, very obvious between the president and his national security cabinet. And it's been a consistent one almost since the, the campaign period. Remember, President Trump campaigned on renegotiating the Iran deal. He distinguished himself even back then in 2015, 2016 from the other Republicans in the race who were all promising to rip up the deal on day one. The president sees himself as a negotiator. This is his background as a, a wheeler dealer in the real estate business. And he is quite convinced, I think, genuinely, that he could somehow produce a better bargain with the Iranians than was negotiated after more than a decade of talks through two administrations from both parties here in, in Washington and with the cooperation of the other permanent five members of the UN Security Council plus Germany. President Trump thinks he can do better than that. 
let him have his opportunity. Of course, uh, what he has staffed himself with is a national security cabinet, and I, I, I don't uh, limit this simply to the national security advisor, John Bolton, but a cabinet that really is invested in this notion that pressure on Iran will work if sufficiently applied. And I think we're living in a real-time experiment. Um, you know, we all remember, at least those of us in Washington, and certainly those of you in Iran, will remember the intense debates that took place around the negotiations that uh, began with Iran, at least in public fashion, in 2013, and then around the nuclear deal once it was concluded in 2015. Was it enough? Should we have gone for broke? We, for the first time in post-revolutionary history, had assembled a multilateral coalition that was, in fact, applying real economic pressure to Iran. Uh, this had never happened before in any serious fashion, not even when American diplomats were held hostage in Iran. Uh, for the first time, this economic pressure was working. It was appearing to produce some new readiness on the part of, as I said, a regime that had been unwilling to engage in a serious way on this issue or many others for many years. Why didn't we simply push it to the natural limit and try to get everything, try to get a much bigger, better deal? Um, I think what you're seeing right now in terms of the kind of strategic impasse that this administration is facing with respect to Iran is that's fine rhetoric and that pressure for the sake of pressure may keep Iran in a box for a period, but it doesn't actually produce a resolution to the situation. And so long as you have Iran facing a virtual economic war uh, with its back against the wall with no serious opportunity for engaging with this administration, although obviously Foreign Minister Zarif's recent appearance on Fox News and his trip to New York last week I think was evidence that they're open to trying. Um, as long as this regime is backed into a corner, we are all very much at the mercy of the decision making in Tehran. And that is a, quite a worrisome thing because there's really only one alternative that the regime has to its, at its disposal at this point in time that can work to its advantage. People worry about will Iran break out of the nuclear deal? Will they retaliate against US forces in the region? These are all reasonable concerns, legitimate concerns. But the real advantage to Iran doesn't come from either of those moves. The real advantage comes to Iran if, in fact, they take some step to disrupt energy supplies coming out of one of their neighbors. It's a long-standing strategic precept for the Iranians that if we can't export, our neighbors won't be able to export either. And the one thing that any disruption to energy supplies would do for Iran is raise the price of oil, improve their own bottom line in terms of whatever revenues they're able to repatriate, and hurt the president's political capital here at home in terms of being able to continue to apply sanctions. And that's a real risk that we face. Wanted to jump in, General Petrus? Well, I, I think that is a real risk. Um, I think, though, that the prospect of President Trump responding with military action against Iran in Iran proper rather than elsewhere, which has generally been the approach that we have taken. Not always, obviously, there's certainly reports of alleged covert action uh, in various locations. But I think that the, that the, the situation is different. I think uh, President Trump presents uh, sort of an unknown risk to them. Uh, he has taken action in Syria when red lines were crossed. It was proportionate, measured, and so forth. But I think that's a concern. But there's no doubt that this is going to hurt a country that already is in a very significant recession, already has very significant inflation, really substantial inflation, and already is watching the real, its currency, uh, decline very precipitously. And so it is going to be in a very tough spot. And the question, I think, is just whether or not they're going to grit their teeth and try to bear this and, and tough it out, noting that there are, there have been lots of signs of unrest, not coordinated, but just somewhat spontaneous demonstrations throughout the country, um, unlike in the past where there generally was some organizing feature or function or, you know, after in the wake of the election, for example, uh, in Tehran. Um, in this case, uh, and there's also environmental degradation that's now starting to cause real movement of people inside with, uh, again, mismanagement of water, uh, on and on. The challenges, I think, are very, very substantial. And again, do they just tough it out till November 2020, hope for someone other than President Trump to be elected? 
uh, or do they actually come to the table sometime next year and say, hey, we'll, let's, uh, let's talk about this? Because then you wrote a book about Iran's political economy, you worked at Exxon. Um, what's your sense of whether they can sustain, they could conceivably go below or at 500,000 barrels per day exported? Is that something that Iran can sustain until November 2020? I think it's an unanswerable question in the sense that Iran can muddle through an enormous amount of economic duress. We've seen this over the past 40 years on repeated occasions, uh, most notably during the 1980s when the war with Iraq was raging and the Saudis, for reasons that had more to do with market share than to do with Iran, decided to try to break OPEC and uh, expanded production to the point that drove Iranian oil revenues down to less than 10 million, uh, less than $10 billion a year. Um, this was an enormously painful episode for Iran, and yet it did not produce a change in Iran's approach to the war with Iraq, at least not in the near term. And it did not, at that time, provoke the kind of internal debate within the system about what are the choices that we face today, because that simply wasn't permissible. I think that we are in a different position today in Iran. Um, we've seen these kinds of debate about the choices available to the regime and the alternatives that the system faces if, in fact, it cannot sustain the degree of uh, economic productivity and at least some sense that there are going to be, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there is a debate both within the regime, but there's also a debate on the streets. As General Petraeus suggested, Iran has been experiencing a considerable degree of very small scale but persistent unrest, almost entirely driven by economic considerations. And so to the extent that the sole priority for the leadership of the Islamic Republic is the preservation of the system, um, they have to recognize that any amount of economic duress, particularly one that doesn't have a natural end state, there isn't a war that can be ended, there isn't a drought that can simply be resolved by a change in weather patterns, that this is in fact a long-term economic siege that the system has to muddle through. My sense is that the, the leadership will not try to simply wait it out until 2021. They are trying to demonstrate that they have some staying power, that they're not going to collapse immediately, and I think it was important. You know, you didn't see Zarif here in September saying that they were open to a prisoner negotiations. They waited until it was clear that maximum pressure had been applied. But if you think back to, to, the, 20, to the 2013 negotiations, even the, the back channel conversations, um, that wasn't, it was a period of months be between the application of the full weight of American financial sanctions targeting Iran's energy exports and the beginning of some of those more productive conversations with the Iranians. And I think it was a recognition at the time that they simply, while they might be able to muddle through, they simply didn't want to because it endangered the long-term vitality of the system. Today, those pressures are even more acute with 80 million Iranians and 160 million SIM cards, a cell phone in every hand, the fact that information disperses very quickly, the fact that there is already a jockeying for succession around the future of the supreme leader who has recently turned 80. This is a, a system that recognizes that it doesn't have time to spare, and so I think they're looking for a way out of the impasse that they're facing. Unfortunately, the administration, despite the fact that the president himself may be interested in a negotiation, hasn't created any kind of a credible platform or framework for negotiations. It's possible they're doing this behind the scenes via Oman. There were many who worried about what the Obama administration was doing back in 2012 before it became clear that some of these conversations were already underway. But it, it, we don't see any evidence of it either from Iran's behavior or from this administration. And I think, again, that lack of a, of a direct channel to try to find a way out of this impasse is going to be something that turns the Iranians away from potentially some kind of diplomatic dialogue and in the direction of trying to provoke a crisis. General, did you want to weigh Well, I, I think it's entirely possible this time that they're driven down to below 500,000 barrels, maybe even lower. I mean, there are going to be some that are produced by Sinopec and another Chinese company. They're actually doing the production, presumably the export. Maybe that slides through. But I think 
again, the situation is different. This administration is different. Um, the waivers that were allowed uh, obviously are going away. There were still some there and, you know, both Bill and I were in, in position back the last time this was done. Uh, and this was very carefully calibrated. And, and, and as we were reminiscing, I was the one who went to the Saudis and asked Adil Al-Jabor, the ambassador, uh, to convey the need to produce an additional one million barrels and to either tell the market or go out and individually tell countries so that the market wouldn't spook. And by the way, it did not. Um, I think the Saudis will pick up the slack again this time, along with the Emiratis, perhaps the Iraqis, and, and then our shale producers. Uh, but I think you're going to see this. It's entirely likely that it could go well below 500,000 barrels. The Chinese, at a time of these very sensitive trade negotiations, don't want to pick a fight with the U.S. over a few hundred thousand barrels of oil that probably can be replaced again by the Saudis, the Emiratis, or others. Um, India, I don't think, again, wants to, to get crosswise either. So I think this is a very different situation for the Iranians. And the other factor I didn't mention, of course, is as a result of all of the uh, developments that I mentioned, uh, there's increased unemployment in the country that already was suffering from a lot of unemployment. So this is a very, very difficult situation that they face. I'm sure we'll get back to some of those in the Q&A, but I want to move, Bill, to the JCPOA, the Iran deal, which was one of the most hotly debated geopolitical decisions over the last decade in the I U.S. I noticed that. You noticed that, and is uh, coming to the fore again, uh, and certainly the Democratic primary debate, it seems to be one of the chief uh, foreign policy questions, the decision whether or not the United States should should go back to the JCPOA in the event that the JCPOA is, is, sustains itself over the, over the next couple of years. So, my, my question to you is, how would you, um, how, how do you see the future of the JCP? Uh, uh, imagine it th is able to survive, which is not a foregone conclusion over the next two years, and a democratic administration comes to office. What would you be, what would be your advice in terms of how to think about the future of the JCPOA? Sure. Well, let me, before I get to that question, let, let me just make two points on, on what Dave and Suzanne have been saying. First, I do think the situation is in some ways different today. I do not underestimate the capacity of the United States through the unilateral imposition of sanctions to do an awful lot of economic damage to Iran. And you're right, the energy market is different too. However, I come back to a point I made at the start, and that is that that kind of leverage and pressure only works um, if it's connected to a realistic set of aims. And my concern right now is what's on offer for the Iranians, the 12 points that Secretary Pompeo laid out, um, is in effect aimed not at producing a better deal, but at producing either the capitulation of this Iranian regime or its implosion, neither of which I think is, is tethered to history, as I suggested before. So that's one point. The second is just simply to state that you know, I believe that the president's decision to pull out of the JCPOA was an historic mistake. And I think that for the following reasons. First, you know, it's done a lot of collateral damage, not just to our credibility in terms of negotiating with other countries against a pattern of retreat, not just from the Iran nuclear agreement, but from the Paris Climate Agreement, from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the big trade agreement in Asia. That's first. Second, I, I think it does actually widen the fissures between us and our closest European allies who are trying to uh, hold the agreement together, in effect doing Vladimir Putin's work for him. Third, I think it is eroding over time the efficacy of sanctions because sanctions worked in the run-up to the talks that began in 2013 because they were widely shared however grudgingly on the part of Russia and China and some others, it was, it was an international effort that brought real pressure to bear. And I think by unilaterally reimposing sanctions, you have even the foreign minister of Germany, one of our closest allies, standing up a year ago and saying, all of us need to reduce our vulnerability to the US financial system. So that's a cost that's not gonna be uh, seen overnight or next year, but we'll wake up five or six years from now and find that that tool, which we've not always used wisely in the past, uh, is less effective. So to answer your question, if you assume um, that the agreement holds together, which is a big assumption because I do think there's a real danger of inadvertent collisions, I, I take General Petraeus's point that the Iranian regime may be very careful in dealing with this president, 
But you know, as we both know, the Middle East is the land of where stuff happens. Things happen, you can escalate very quickly. We've been all very fortunate in the last two and a half years in this administration that the United States has not faced a prolonged international crisis. I never served an administration where you went that long without a prolonged international crisis. But I worry about the incoherence that Kareem mentioned you know, between the president and some of his senior advisors and our capacity to manage that kind of an escalation. So, but if you assume that the agreement is still living and breathing um, you know, in January 2001 and you have a different administration, I think it would make sense to do two things. First, to resume you know, our compliance with the JCOP, JCPOA to rejoin it, but simultaneously you would have to start you know, a serious negotiation, a kind of follow-on negotiation, which you know, I've always experienced in any arms control process that I've been involved in, which would deal with some of the obvious challenges in the JCPOA. Some of the provisions in that agreement, the so-called sunset clauses, would be much closer to their expiry. We'd have to begin a conversation about a range of other issues that are not dealt with in that comprehensive nuclear agreement on ballistic missile development, to begin a conversation about challenges where we bump into each other across the Middle East. So I think so long as we were able to couple a resumption of US participation in that agreement with a serious negotiation simultaneously about follow-on understandings, I think that's what would make sense. Thank you. I, I want to move uh, in a second to audience questions, so please uh, think about what you'd like to ask. But I'd be remiss for uh, if, if I neglect following question, which I'll pose to all of you, two-part, and you can feel free to, to take uh, each question or ignore them, but it was the decision to, Trump administration's decision to designate the Revolutionary Guards a terrorist organization. This is a decision that I know the Bush administration was contemplating, um, Obama administration was contemplating, um, but it was, uh, uh, you know, the Revolutionary Guards have, over the last decade, become Iran's most important economic political institution, uh, what, what are the ramifications of that designation? Do you agree with it? And then second, it, it, what we've seen over the last decade and a half in the Middle East is kind of Iran trying to McDonaldize the Hezbollah model, you know, to, to franchise Hezbollah from Lebanon to Iraq to Syria to Yemen. And at a time when most Americans don't want a greater presence in the Middle East, how do we contend with Iran? So perhaps, General Petraeus, we can start with you and then we'll come. Well, sure. First of all, I am not sure that the, this latest designation is as significant as it sounds because they had already, IRGC had already been designated by the Treasury Department, which is the one that, frankly, most counts. And there are already some, uh, I, if you call them exceptions or explanations of what the latest designation actually means. Um, given how entwined the IRGC is, as you mentioned, in the economy, the diplomacy, and all the other activities. So I'm not so sure that this is a, this is very important in rhetorical policy, and that does matter. Uh, that is not insignificant um, for the State Department and so forth. Uh, but again, the big designation is the one that generally follows the Treasury, and that had already identified uh, the IRGC, not just the Quds Force, uh, again, as a, a, essentially a terrorist entity. Um, the second, uh, look, I think it's very important to understand that Iran has for some time wanted to Lebanonize Iraq and Syria, uh, as you described it. And in other words, they want to do in those countries what they have done successfully uh, in Lebanon, which is to create a very powerful paramilitary force, which gives them enormous muscle in the street, particularly in Shia uh, areas of a country, uh, and then to follow that by getting that same force enormous power in the parliament, uh, in the legislature of a country, uh, to the point that in Lebanon, its coalition around Hezbollah actually has uh, a blocking veto if they choose to use that. Um, more difficult to do this in, in Syria, certainly, where there's always been some differences to begin with, uh, and it's not quite the same kind of structure and so forth. Uh, but Iraq, uh, I think this is a, a significant challenge. Uh, the Council of Representatives does have some members, as I mentioned earlier, who actually are leaders of the militia, the Hashtashabi, the 
popular mobilization forces. One of the big challenges that this very impressive leadership team of the President, the Prime Minister, and uh, Speaker of the Council of Representatives in Iraq have is how to uh, deal with the fact that not all of the entities uh, that have uh, force, if you will, as you all know, uh, you know, a government has to have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. This is a problem if you have a f an element uh, such as those in the Hashtashavi. Noting, by the way, and we should all acknowledge that they did serve Iraq at a time when the Islamic State was literally knocking on the doors or on the, the walls of Baghdad and did come to the service of their country. And tragically, uh, the situation was allowed to reach that point uh, where uh, the Grand Ayatollah and Najaf actually had to essentially say, uh, now is the time to come to the aid of your country, uh, which legitimized the return of these militia to the street militia that you will recall have been destroyed uh, back during the battles of March and April 2008 uh, in Basra, throughout the southern provinces, in Sadr City, in Kadami, and a variety of other places. Um, so with that understanding, um, again, what do we have to do? It comes back to what Bill was talking about with uh, actions to undermine the effectiveness of elements that would like to, again, take control of Iraq. Uh, in Iraq, a country that has to have a relationship with Iran, again, it's always going to be its bigger neighbor to the east. We have to understand that. We have to uh, try not to be an obstacle to that. But it should be a mutually productive, uh, mutually beneficial relationship, not one in which Iran can lean on Iraq uh, and get what they want done through various levers of power that they control. Um, now, what else do we need to do? Uh, well, we should certainly make sure uh, that whatever our plans for Syria are, uh, that we do not allow the establishment of a ground line of communication. And I'm talking now about a hardball road. You can go through the desert in various places, uh, for Iraq and into Syria, but we're talking about big trucks uh, that would carry major items of equipment, and we should ensure together with our Iraqi partners, that Iraq does not become uh, a, line, a ground line of communication from uh, Iran through Iraq, through Syria, and down into southern Lebanon and, and Hezbollah, or to uh, Iranian military industries in Syria, which clearly Israel, uh, our ally, has shown that they will not allow. Uh, so to avoid that turning into a bigger crisis, again, I think we can make a major contribution by staying as we have at the border crossing at Al Tamf, uh, which is one of the two hardball crossings, the other one obviously being up at Al Qaim and Huseiba, uh, and, and is reasonably well covered, I think, by uh, Iraqi security forces together with some of our uh, coalition forces. So that's a very, very significant goal. Uh, it was something that could have been called into question by a complete withdrawal from Syria, but uh, reportedly is very much in the forefront of the mind in the White House state and defense. Then um, I'd also like to ask both you and Bill, uh, there, there um, are some concerns. You know, Arab Gulf officials claim that they've picked up intelligence that Iran is planning to uh, go after them in the region as a reaction to uh, US escalation, obviously go after them via proxy. So in addition to the, the earlier questions I posed, if you can talk about maybe some of your concerns of uh, possible escalation in the coming months? Well, I, in terms of the designation itself, I tend to agree with General Petraeus. I think um, it, it doesn't really change the game in terms of pressure on Iran. Uh, I think some of the reaction here in Washington and elsewhere may have contributed to this overhyping of the, uh, of the issue itself. Um, both from the administration, but also from its critics, those who immediately leapt to the presumption that this was a slippery slope to war, uh, I think are reading far too much into the reality of this mechanism. And there is a temptation, a tendency that I've seen, at least for the past dozen years, for uh, every group in Washington uh, and it, 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 again, it's deep state, it's applied both to Republican and Democratic administrations to see every evidence of pressure on Iran as a step toward war. I, I don't think that has been the case. It hasn't proven to be the case to date. Uh, and I think the fact that you have a commander in chief that for whatever his other flaws 
seems to be deeply averse to any kind of military, US military intervention in the Middle East um, is at least something of a check on a deliberate move toward a, a, a military crisis in the region. As I said, I have great concerns about the risks of inadvert inadvertent escalation. But I don't think this administration is trying to uh, jump into a war, and I'm, uh, I don't quite buy into the, the hype that the president's advisors are trying to trick him into a war because that's what they're after. Um, so I think we have to be careful uh, to analyze the specific steps and their particular implications rather than to read too much into them. Um, in terms of the broader regional influence question and uh, how Iran may retaliate against some of its adversaries across the region, I think we're left with this you know, perennial dilemma. Um, what we've found is that uh, engagement with Iran hasn't in fact ameliorated Iran's capacity to extend its influence, often in ways that are destabilizing, uh, often in ways that are inimical to US interests and to the broader interests in a peaceful, prosperous Middle East. Um, but we've found that pressure hasn't yet produced a, a, a significant change for the better either, whether it was under the Bush administration, whether it's under the current administration. Um, there is some evidence that the sanctions are having an impact on Iran's capacity to provide financial support to Hezbollah, possibly also on the oil subsidy that has been a longstanding feature of the relationship with Syria. But ultimately, it's not really undermining Iran's posture across the region. And what we've seen, you know, if you thought back 20 years ago, when I first started working on Iran, the, the idea that Iran could in fact be the ascendant power across the Levant would have been inconceivable. Um, and so I think we have to begin to look at the other factors. Obviously, they're there, and obviously there are lots of folks who spend a lot of time thinking about this. But we often have these conversations almost in disjointed ways about an Iran that is uh, in, in, inevitably uh, hegemonic and uh, one that is uh, seemingly all-powerful. Um, but we ignore the rest of the, the factors that our friends like Michelle Dunn spend a lot of time on in terms of uh, leadership and governance across the broader Middle East. And I think if we want to really address the crisis that Iran has contributed to, is benefiting from, it really is incumbent upon us to think about how we address the vacuum of good governance and, and um, enlightened leadership in the Arab world, because that's exactly those, those vacuums that Iran moves into, takes advantage of, sets up these parallel institutions that then, in effect, hijack and strangle uh, the institutions of the state itself. Very good point. Bill? Yeah, and I guess that returns me to the original point I'd made about containment as a sort of framework for thinking about American strategy toward Iran, however imperfect the analogy to the Soviet Union and the old Cold War. Because what um, uh, Suzanne said is exactly right. I mean, part of what animated containment in George Kennan's view was the importance of shoring up you know, neighboring countries, re reducing their vulnerabilities. And you know, I think right now, in an era in which you can see the deeper drivers of change throughout much of the Sunni Arab world in particular accelerating and the dysfunctions getting worse, you know, we're doing too much indulging, I think, of authoritarian regimes who aren't paying attention to those internal problems, which create opportunities for what is essentially a counterpunching regime like Iran, which is not 10 feet tall, but takes advantage of the vulnerabilities and dysfunctions of others. So that's an extremely important part, I think, of a sensible American strategy, which you don't see much in evidence today. Beyond that, I think it's the point also I made that, of course, pressure matters. You have to push back against external overreach, but that has to be combined with a willingness to selectively engage and not see diplomacy as a favor or a reward for bad behavior, but rather as a smart investment, because by engaging, you're better able to mobilize lots of other countries um, who, when we can demonstrate we're not the problem, it's Iranian behavior that's the problem, that's what animated you know, a large part of what President Obama tried to do in the run up to the nuclear negotiation. Good point, so we have uh, about 20 or so minutes for questions and uh, if we can get quick questions, we can get quick answers and fit in as many as possible. So I'll try to take two at a time, this gentleman in the front, wait for the microphone and if you can uh, be brief and introduce yourself as well. Um, my name is Sufi Lagari with the Sindhi Foundation. Uh, just a report today came in religious freedom, uh, and Iran has 300 Sufis who are 
sentences. Baha is in problem, Kurdish is in problem, Awaz is in problem, Baloch is in problem. I think administration should take not just to as a regime, but this mullahs is a problem everywhere. If we countering the Iran, we should not forget about the Wahhabi Islam. I'm from that region. Both are major problem. I don't know how to, when you countering the Iran, also we have to not forget about this Wahhabi Islam. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there was a gentleman here in the front. Hi, my name is Benjamin Weil, up until recently the uh, international policy advisor of the Israeli Minister of Energy, who's a security cabinet member. My question is uh, regarding um, the peace talks that we were talking about and the agreement, uh, that seems to tackle one of the legs that Iran stands on, which is the nuclear program, but then there's the other regional problem, whether it's Hezbollah, Hamas, Houthis, etc. And I think that the sanctions are geared to tackle that problem. I was wondering if uh, you see one solution for both those problems, or maybe there needs to be a more complex solution that'll tackle the internal nuclear problem and the more regional one of support to terrorist activity in the region. Thank you. Why don't we take one more? Is there any, anyone in the back? Please, in the front here. Uh, Barbara Pladasher from the BBC. Could you all maybe just briefly um, talk about what you think the game plan of this administration is? You've, t you've alluded to it in different ways, but if you would just say what you think the, the administration is actually up to, if indeed it does have a game plan. Um, sure, just very quickly. I mean, on game plan, um, you know, on, on the face of it, the game plan would be, as I was suggesting before, uh, producing through maximum pressure either the capitulation of this regime, not the negotiation of a better deal, or its implosion. Now, I, I don't think I share the views of my colleagues. I don't think President Trump himself is a military interventionist. But it, it remains um, you know, sort of opaque to me about whether there's a serious negotiating strategy here or not. Um, so that's how I'd respond to that question. I think that there is a, a, a consensus within the administration that includes the president that pressure is good and pressure for the sake of pressure may produce a desired outcome. Now the president would prefer negotiations. Um, much of the rest of the senior cabinet appears to prefer either something that looks like a capitulation or an implosion. Um, but for the moment, they're all agreed upon uh, a strategy of maximum pressure and it plays into this presumption that, that many hold that you know Iran will bend, but it won't bend to a little bit of pressure. You need a lot. Um, on the question about whether there's one solution for everything with Iran, I think, again, this is the experiment we're living out in real time. Um, the crit criticism of the JCPOA was that it didn't deal with the non-nuclear issues, and that was, of course, by design. It was designed, in fact, by the Bush administration. President Obama took most of the criticism for it. Um, but the negotiations were never intended to address the wider array of issues. What I worry about is the fact that the Trump administration's action in terms of withdrawing or walking away from the JCPOA has tainted the idea of transactionalism with Iran. The concept that you can solve one problem, continue to disagree on others, and, and look for solutions on them. Um, I think it's going to be much more difficult to strike and sustain a, 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 a narrow bargain, narrow meaning to one set of issues rather than the others. And I say that though I'm completely, uh, uh, un, completely pessimistic throughout the course of my career that there is a grand bargain to be had with Iran. Um, it simply isn't there. But I, I think we are facing a structural problem in engaging with Iran in the future in that we have now, I think, uh, uh, validated the, the fears and the paranoia of the senior leadership that uh, one small set of concessions will only lead to pressure for concessions on everything else. You know. um, on the first question, I think, um, look, there is a legitimate concern about uh, Wahhabist uh, influence. Uh, the Saudis in the past uh, obviously have funded uh, a variety of initiatives uh, that promoted that. We have seen, all of us I think, have seen the effects in places uh, in Europe, uh, Bosnia where I spent a year, uh, there was an influence of this. Uh, what has been encouraging um, 
certainly there are uh, some issues that give you great disquiet, but what has been encouraging uh, with the Vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia is an explicit commitment uh, to dial that back quite considerably and to promote a degree of moderation uh, in the practice of Islam even inside the kingdom. And it's not as widely recognized uh, because it was not broad news, but uh, the Crown Prince uh, also replaced some 50 or so clerics, hardline clerics, uh, I don't know, a year, a year and a half ago, somewhere around that time, as part of the effort uh, to, again, promote a degree, again, everything is relative, uh, of moderation. Um, on the, the regional uh, activities of Iran, I do want to uh, just build a little bit on what Suzanne said uh, about this earlier. I do think it's a reasonable question to ask whether or not the sanctions are finally going to reduce Iran's capacity to continue to fund uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, Bashar al-Assad um, militia in Iraq, militia perhaps uh, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, some other actors in Bahrain or wherever, a, a, again, a smaller scale. Um, this is going to become, I think, increasingly difficult uh, in a sense to sell to the public, not that they do have to sell it, but it does ultimately come out. There have been disclosures about how much money has gone to these different activities, and the Iranian people are going to say, my gosh, look what you have done to our economy uh, because of your nefarious activities or your support of these different groups abroad. We're the ones who are tightening the belt. Um, at least spend the money at home and don't keep uh, digging ourselves a bigger hole. Uh, and then when it comes to the game plan for the administration, I think the big question here is, are the 12 demands that Secretary Pompeo announced in his speech, I guess at Heritage, uh, not long after he uh, became the Secretary of State, um, are these opening positions for negotiation or are these absolutely non-negotiable? I tend to think that they are the former um, but again, we will have to see uh, over time whether that's the case. And I don't expect anything in the next few months, perhaps even in the remainder of this year. The big question is at a certain point in time in the next year, uh, whether or not the Iranians calculate that they just again grit their teeth until the election uh, in hopes of a change, or if they agree to come to the table then. Some more questions, this gentleman here in the center. Working? Thank you. Uh, Peter Shutley, retired State Department Foreign Service. What is the risk that Netanyahu will look at the situation and say, we have a limited window of opportunity, uh, Trump may not be around after two more years. Now is the time to take some military action against Iran, and we've got the U.S. on our side. What's the risk of that? Can I answer that very quickly and just say that the window of opportunity closed back when Bill was, I think, still the undersecretary and I was the director of the CIA? Uh, gentleman here in the front, microphone's coming. That's slightly tongue-in-cheek, but not entirely. following Chairman uh, Howard Berman's leadership of the Foreign uh, Affairs Committee maybe, was with us. Uh, you what? didn't have the mic, so just briefly introduce yourself. Uh, Jim Moran, uh, uh, and uh, served in the Congress for a little while. Uh, I, I wanted you to address uh, a, a couple of issues. Uh, one is the concept of an Arab NATO, and whether this is not problematic in, in terms of our long-term objectives. Another is, um, uh, the, the fact that the president has supported MBS's support of General Haftar's assault on the government of Libya, which we have supported as has the United Nations, it seems to be a precedent for further mischief and, uh, uh, and, and dissolution of our long-term plans for the region. Uh, but uh, let me just say, I couldn't agree more with your insight that Iran uh, seizes opportunities that are created by these authoritarian, unenlightened uh, 
Arab leaders, uh, and, and that may be the source, much of the source of the problem we have. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to say, I guess my answer to your two questions, Congressman, would be first, I think the first is an illusion, the idea of an Arab NATO in any formal sense. We've seen this movie before, going back 60 years. It rarely pans out. That's not to suggest that there aren't, as General Petraeus knows better than anybody, lots of ways in which we can coordinate militarily. But the idea of a formal alliance like that is an illusion. And the second, on support for General Heftar, I think is foolish. Um, you know, I think, you know, Libya, Lord knows, has more than its share of fragilities and insecurities right now. But I think it's foolish to assume that there's a military solution here that General Heftar is going to produce. And so I think all anybody who's supporting him is doing right now, you know, including the president's phone call to him and, you know, apparent support um, is just going to produce more hardship, more trouble for a society that has more than its share already. I just build on the first one, and great to see you again, Congressman, uh, and former chairman. Um, you know, when I was a Central Command commander, we thought that the most important way in which you could integrate capabilities, and this is without any kind of alliance structure or uh, military force, uh, was just to start by integrating the ballistic missile uh, threat warning system, uh, which was not integrated. By the way, it was a common system generally on, built on uh, U.S. Uh, early warning radars and Patriots and, and a variety of others. And we had a lot of, as you may recall, we had batteries of Patriots in just about every country up and down the Gulf. Uh, this was at a time when Qatar was still a member in good standing of the GCC. That is obviously not the case now. Uh, and frankly, we could never actually get them to even allow the others to see their feeds, in other words, what their radars, the radars on their soil that they owned, uh, were actually identifying. And so, I mean, that seemed to me to be a relatively low bar to get over if you really wanted to coordinate activity. Uh, there's nothing offensive about it. It's entirely defensive. Uh, and in the end, Central Command ended up by default being the integrator. In other words, we had the feeds of all of them and then we would put it together in our own ballistic missile defense system. So, gosh, if you can't get to that back in the days when, again, generally the GCC was together, there were always some reservations by some of the, the Gulf states that Qatar uh, had relationships with Iran that were a bit concerning. Uh, some of that, again, is just reality. They share the biggest oil, one of the biggest gas fields in the world and had to have a relationship. Um, but if you couldn't get that, uh, gosh, it's really hard to envision something like a NATO, and especially now that one of the key GCC members uh, has really been cast out from the fold, N not from the GCC, but certainly is being cut off in a variety of other ways. Great. We have time for two quick more questions in the way back. I see a hand. Hello, this is Gabriele Barbati with Voice of America. For General Petraeus, I would like to know what's your take about the comments by Iran's Foreign Minister Jawad Zarif about the fact that the, the U.S. administration may be lured into war by, quote, accidents. And I would add also, what if uh, Iran intervened somehow in the Strait of Hormuz? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay. Why don't uh, we start with you, General Petraeus, and then Suzanne and, and sure. Bill, any final thoughts? I Look, I think it would be very, very unwise uh, were Iran to precipitate some kind of activity uh, in the Strait of Hormuz. Um, in general, Iran has been quite restrained in the kind of activity that characterized some of their actions uh, in the past, uh, where they run a lot of speedboats or these high uh, capacity speedboats at our ships and all the rest of that and turn out off at the last minute. They did, however, run a, apparently uh, put a UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, over one of our large ships uh, in the past week or so. Uh, at least according to a press report, and I haven't had that confirmed from elsewhere. Uh, but I think they've got to be very careful about this action. Uh, again, as was mentioned earlier, um, President Trump, from their perspective, presumably uh, a bit less predictable, um, perhaps uh, less restrained uh, if they provoke something uh, 
And you don't know where that goes, as uh, we all well know. I mean, when you roll the iron dice, um, who knows where, tell me how this ends, uh, as someone said on the road to Baghdad. Um, and the idea that, it, that the administration would be lured into war, uh, again, I, again, think that that is pretty unlikely. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think opportunities by any other country um, in the region to uh, do significant damage to some of the components of the Iran program. Um, this was limited all the way back in, again, 2010 or 2011. Uh, and the idea that, again, that, the, that one, someone would try to calculate what could happen, uh, I think is, is really somewhat questionable. Um, I, I just don't see this happening. Suzanne, Bill, uh, we're in, as I said, the 40th anniversary of the Islamic Republic. And I guess for both of you, uh, final thoughts. I'm curious, Suzanne, it's never wise to make predictions about Iran, but where do you envision we could potentially become the 50th anniversary, the societal political trend lines? And, and for Bill, what would be a wise US policy to ensure that it, it, it does transition to something more positive? I have tried to steer away from making predictions because as anyone who knows Iran knows, uh, it's absolutely impossible to predict with any degree of accuracy what may happen in that country. I also recall being part of a group of people who were watching uh, the Iranian president address the UN, uh, secure, uh, the UN General Assembly back in 2000 when it was the year of the Dialogue of Civilizations. And we took a, a set of predictions about when a US embassy might reopen in Tehran. I was the least optimistic of the group, uh, and I predicted 2009. And I will note that one of, the, one of the people who was part of that conversation is now sitting in a prison cell in Iran. Um, so let me, with that caveat, say that I think that Iran is well positioned to make a stable transition to some sort of better governance. Um, it's, it, it's simply unparalleled in terms of the, the, the capacity of a system that has already had this sort of wrestling with authoritarianism, wrestling with the role of religion and politics in which there is a, now a really well-honed experience with the mechanics of democracy, if not the, the realities of a truly representative government. There's been more than a century of debate among Iranians about how to get accountability from, its, from their own leadership. Um, but that said, when and how that transition happens, I think, is entirely impossible to predict. Um, and I think it's very unlikely to come under the type of uh, catastrophic economic pressure that is being applied to Iran today and is going to be applied for the foreseeable future. There's simply no precedent for that kind of hardship producing uh, a transition to a more responsible set of leaders. And what I think we haven't really thought through is, are the potential inadvertent consequences of the current policy outside of the, the real risks of some kind of military escalation. What does it do to the, the prospects for some kind of um, much more uh, positive transition in Iran in the long term? And if regime implosion brings regime change of a type that actually produces a less responsible and a more dictatorial and a more dangerous uh, set of actors led by some of the people ge that General Petraeus has had to deal with before, uh, I think, in fact, we could be facing a, 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 a potential outcome which is much worse than the one that we face today. General, did you want? I actually just wanted to qualify the very quick response I gave earlier about the window of vulnerability. That's based basically on an assumption that there is not a resumption of the nuclear program. Um, okay. But it, I mean, it is a reality about the, capa or the, the qualities of the different elements of that program. Uh, but assuming there's not something, now if that happens, then I think all bets are off perhaps even with the United States. Uh, and that's when I think you start to get really concerned. So, Bill, your diplomatic efforts help prevent Iran from becoming like North Korea. Is there a U.S. policy that could help Iran become like South Korea? <laughs> no, I mean, I think the one thing I've learned over many years in the Middle East is the limits of U.S. agency um, and our ability to affect regime change in a sensible way. 
um, or um, even to predict, as Suzanne was trying to do, the evolution of another society. Having said that, I share Suzanne's view that, you know, I, I do think we ought to approach Iran's future with a certain amount of confidence in the following sense. I don't think the current theocratic leaders in that regime have answers for what's on the mind of a very young population, 70% of which today is under the age of 30. Having said that, I just think there's a smart way and a dumb way for the United States to manage what is a very complicated and largely adversarial relationship between now and then. And you know, as I've suggested before, I think the smarter way is not to operate with illusions, to push back on behavior which threatens us and the interests of our friends, not to be shy about human rights issues, but to selectively engage, and as Suzanne said, be transactional in places where you can reduce um, not eliminate, but reduce some of the most imminent dangers that an unconstrained Iranian nuclear program would pose. And, and I think that's, that was the essence of the Iranian nuclear agreements, both the interim agreement and then the comprehensive one. They did not solve the totality of threats that this Iranian regime posed, but I think they were a way of managing that relationship. And I think that approach, that broad strategy, still makes sense for the United States. Well, I want to thank you all very much for coming and thank those who have been watching online in Iran and in the U.S. And join me in thanking the panel.